right, welcome everyone. It is so good to have you with us tonight. We've got a few visitors with us, and <laughs> that's all good. Um, appreciate y'all joining us tonight as we uh, dive into some some good stuff. Um, I've been out of town a little bit. Well, actually, the last few months, I think, Gilbert, I've been in and out of town almost every week, I think. So it's good to be with you tonight, be able to share. And uh, I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. That's what we're going to talk about tonight, rethinking strongholds. Um, <clears throat> before I get into that, I just want to make a couple of quick announcements uh, in case you uh, aren't aware. We're going to be in Tucson, Arizona. That's going to be January 14th and 15th. Yeah, Friday and Saturday of, um, of January. We'll be in Tucson, Arizona doing a conference over there on, uh, on the prophetic. It's going to be, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that the Lord is upgrading in our thinking, right? Especially as we come into understanding the kingdom, understanding what Christ has accomplished, um, our lenses are changing, right? And whenever, whenever you begin to see through new lenses, you begin to, uh, to rethink everything. And so everything right now is being upgraded. There are ways that we're seeing now uh, that are giving us clarity uh, that we didn't have before. And so we're grateful for that. And we just felt like um, something is on, on the heart of God for, for Tucson, Arizona. Not that any other city is exempt. I mean, it's his heart is obviously for every city, but we just felt something on the timetable of God for Tucson, Arizona, and so uh, we'll be we'll be there at the uh, the Aloft uh, Marriott there in Tucson near the university, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we do have some seats available still for that. There's no charge for in-person registration. Um, if you're wanting to live stream, uh, we will be charging for that for the live stream. And uh, Gilbert, where where can they go for that? Is that on um, the COA? C-O-A-T-C dot org, if you want to register for that. C-O-A-T-C dot org, if you want to register for that, okay? And then, of course, we'll be doing our, um, <clears throat> we'll be kicking off the School of the Spirit, which is basically a weekend conference that we'll be doing here uh, at Church of Acts. And it, it's going to be based on what we're sensing the Holy Spirit wanting us to get into. We'll be talking about the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, this, let's see, that's the last weekend of January. And um, can't remember the date on that one, uh, Gilbert, last weekend of January. Uh, 28, 29, 30. There you go. Thank you. And the last week of February, we're going to have uh, Jake Bullard with us. We're going to be having a weekend on dreams, dream interpretation, all that fun stuff. So we got a lot of things going on, and uh, but let's jump into tonight's uh, tonight's message. Uh, like I said, Second Corinthians chapter ten, probably a familiar passage for many people. Uh, I know back in the day when I used to do a lot of spiritual warfare teachings. Okay, before I before I really understood the kingdom perspective on spiritual warfare, uh, this was a big a big topic or a big uh, passage for me. And, and as the Lord has been changing the way we think, and like I said earlier, changing our lenses, uh, we begin to see some things in a different way. And so we're going to talk about strongholds. Uh, and typically, whenever you, you hear the word stronghold, first thing that comes to mind, all right, so we're going to talk about strongholds. First thing that usually comes to mind is some type of demonic uh, <clears throat> power, some type of demonic entity, something over a city, something in a region or whatever. And so typically, we, whenever we think of this word, immediately we want to associate it with something demonic. Okay? That's our first thought normally. And probably because what happens is many times um, <clears throat> we, we have, how do I say this? We have diminished the gospel of Jesus. We have reduced what Christ has accomplished, and we have not understood that what Jesus brought us was victory. <clears throat> Jesus did not die to give you a battle. Jesus died to give you a victory. That's very important. 
Now, <clears throat> we see before the cross, Satan is called prince of this world, right? Before the cross, Satan is called prince of this world. Now, or ruler of this world. Now, where did he get that term? Where did he get that, that position? Well, he stole it from Adam, right? Adam was the one that had dominion. Okay, Adam had dominion. And what we see is that when Adam agrees with the lies of the serpent in Genesis, Adam exchanges for those lies his dominion, his authority, and Satan becomes the ruler of this world. Now, everybody will agree on that, but here's where you have to understand is that there was the last Adam or the second Adam, as Scripture also calls him, Jesus, right? And here's what we need to understand. Why is Jesus called the last Adam or the second Adam? Why is he called that? Because he has come to undo what the first Adam did. The first Adam gives dominion or authority to the enemy. What does the last Adam do? Takes it back. Okay? What does that mean? It means that Satan is no longer called the prince of this world. Satan is not the prince of this world anymore. How do we know that? Because Jesus took that dominion, took that authority that the enemy lied to Adam about or lied to get from Adam. So this is why in Matthew 28, Jesus now says what? All authority, where? Heaven and earth. Man, we're just kicking off tonight, are we? We didn't, no introduction, we're just going, we're going full force, whiteboard anointing. Okay, so, <laughs> so heaven and earth. Jesus says, I now have all authority. So what does that mean? It means that the one who had authority, the enemy, no longer has it. Jesus now has all authority in heaven and earth. And now, now, is Jesus saying this as God or as man? Now, that's a, that's a tricky question. <clears throat> Can you give God authority? No, you can't. You can't give God authority. He, has, I mean, he is the king. He is the sovereign God. So, so now, Jesus is 100% God and 100% man, right? But everything he did in his earthly ministry, he did as a man, not as God. Why do we know, or why is that important? Because God gave dominion to man. Man loses it. Man has to regain it. If God were to regain this authority as God, it would be illegal for man to walk in it again. That makes sense? Because... Because the thing is this, is that if God says, okay, I gave it to man, man lost it, man, you know what, uh, let me go ahead and just take that back, that's, that's not legal. To make it legal, God becomes man. Even though Jesus is fully deity and fully humanity, he sets aside his deity in, in right and authority and power and says, I will do everything dependent upon the Father. Even his own resurrection, right? It's, uh, David prophesied that, that Jesus would have to trust that the Father would not leave him to decay. So, so what we see here is that Jesus has all authority as, a, as humanity. And that is why he is able to restore that authority to the believer. Okay? So, now, now let's, let's, uh, <laughs> let's slow down for a second here and, and, and look at this. When we think of strongholds, the if, if first thing that comes to mind is something demonic because we have been conditioned to focus on a big devil, little God. Okay? And so we think devil big, <laughs> you know, devil powerful, but that's not the way heaven sees what Jesus has done. So the authority of God has been given to you and I, all right? Now, here's the thing. Strongholds, when you look at strongholds in Scripture, which we're going to look at here, 2 Corinthians 
10, 3 through 6, when you look at that, nowhere is there anything mentioned about the demonic. <laughs> Yet it's the first thing that usually comes to our mind, right? And so, so let's look at this here. 2 Corinthians 10. Uh, and I'll just read it first. And then we'll kind of break it down a little bit, okay? For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And we're going to look at verse 6 in a minute here too, because <clears throat> this is not the best translation and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, <clears throat> lots of stuff here, okay? <laughs> lots of stuff we're going to have fun with tonight. And um, let's start off with, with the idea or the word here, strongholds, okay? Uh, let's start off with that. Because stronghold is the first thing that um, you begin to, to think about in this verse or in this passage here. And really, the term stronghold, uh, it was a military term. And it meant a fortified place. Okay, a fortified place. <clears throat> um, you see this word quite a bit in the Old Testament uh, for fortress. Okay a fortified place, a fortress, all right? Now, <clears throat> uh, when you think about a stronghold, immediately the first thing that comes to mind is something negative, right? But the thing is this, is that a stronghold is not necessarily negative. A stronghold simply is, because e even um, Proverbs 10.29 says, God is our stronghold, right? So, so a stronghold is not necessarily negative or whatever. A stronghold it can be God. God can be your stronghold. Um, truth can become a stronghold. So yes, lies can become a stronghold. And in, and in fact, stronghold within context, within the context of this right here, that stronghold that's mentioned in 2 Corinthians 10 is actually referring to lies. Okay, the lies that we are believing. Okay, uh, and here's, here's what it basically is. Stronghold, here's the definition of it. Reasonings, ways of thinking. Okay, reasonings or ways of thinking that someone uses to fortify their beliefs. Okay. A stronghold literally, okay, let me uh, make sure I give this to you correctly here. Strongholds are reasonings okay, ways of thinking I don't know if the camera can pick this up, I'm writing a little smaller now just because it's space. Ways of thinking that someone uses to what? To fortify, okay, to fortify their beliefs. Strongholds are ways of thinking that fortify your beliefs. And here's the second part, okay? And defend what you believe. All right? Strongholds are actually reasonings or ways of thinking that someone uses to fortify their beliefs and to defend their beliefs. Now, what about if 
if you believe the truth and that reasoning, that way of thinking of truth begins to fortify what you believe about God, what you believe about yourself, right? That when you look in Scripture, and Scripture, like in 2 Corinthians 5, where it says that he who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of Christ in God. If you believe that, man, I am the righteousness of Christ in God. If that becomes your reasoning, if that becomes your way of thinking, then when a lie comes against your identity, no, no, I've got a fortified belief system. This is who God says that I am. This is who he has determined about my, what he's determined about my identity. And you defend what you believe because that truth has become your stronghold. Amen? So, so strongholds are not necessarily like always negative. A stronghold is a stronghold and it can be used for the positive or for the negative. All right? So what I want, I want any stronghold that I've ever had of lies to become strongholds of truth, right? I mean, I believed that God was distant, angry, you know, judgmental. I believed that. And so that, that reasoning, that belief system fortified my thought process, fortified my beliefs that when something negative happened, this is a judgment from God because I didn't do good enough. See, that was a stronghold that I thought God was distant, angry, and judgmental. And yet Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. No distance. No, He's not like trying to judge people. He's trying to set them free from the lies. He says, in fact, you've already condemned yourselves. You've already judged yourselves. I'm trying to bring you into the truth of what the Father thinks about you. So, so the strongholds can shift from the negative to the positive from the lies to the truth and, and, and to the point where you might have had such a deep stronghold in a certain area, negative, and you can have even greater of a deep stronghold of truth, of this is who the Father is, this is who I am, this is what I've been given, and this is what I was born for. And you come alive in the truth of God, and when the enemy tries to hit this stronghold of truth, uh -uh. I've got fortified beliefs and I can defend what I believe because of what Jesus has accomplished in my life. Amen? <laughs> and so, so this is, this is where, where the stronghold, our ideas of strongholds need to shift. Okay? Um, because a kingdom stronghold or a kingdom perception of stronghold can, can change everything. All right, so, so the idea uh, behind a stronghold also, we talked about a fortified place, right? The idea behind a stronghold is that um, it's, it's something that's being held to be, to be kept safe, right? And so what, what you begin to believe, whether it's truth or, or lies, what you believe without realizing it, you'll create a fortified place where you, you need to keep that belief system safe. And we'll even protect lies, won't we? We'll protect lies. Because it's like, you know, well, somebody will tell you a truth. Well, no, brother, you don't know. You don't know what I've done. You don't know this. You don't know that. Truth is not defined by what you've done. It's, truth is defined by what he says. And, and, and if you believe what he says, then you'll do your actions will begin to adjust to match what you believe. What we've tried to do is we've tried to change our belief or, or, or what we do. We've tried to change what we do to somehow come into truth. Coming into truth is about shifting the way you think and the way you think begins to adjust what you do or don't do. Right? Doing is actually a reflection of believing. So what we need to do is stop being... Um, how do I say, stop being an, a specialist of actions and start being a specialist of beliefs because your belief system will begin to define what you do. All behavior is rooted in identity. 
All doing is the fruit of believing. And so whatever you believe, you will begin to manifest in what you do. Right? So, so this is where the shifting is taking place in the body of Christ, that the stronghold of God can come in and produce a different reaction or response or, or actions in your life. Okay? Different behavior. Okay? So, so we, we've, we've thought Jesus came to change behavior. But the, the problem is this. Actually, what Jesus came to do was change nature. <laughs> you shift the nature of a thing and the behavior of it will shift with it. Right? So Jesus doesn't die for behavior modification. Jesus actually dies to make you a new creation. And as a new creation, you begin to have a new outcome. But religion, religion has reduced Jesus' victory to simply changing your behavior. Jesus has forgiven you now, and now you can try to be a better person. No, no, no. Paul says, you're a whole new creation. You're a brand new creature. There's not even a word for you. And so when you begin to believe that, it begins to manifest in your actions. Okay? So, so here's what we see here. Let's back up a little bit. Verse 3, um, verses 3 and 4 here. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Now, when he uses the term flesh there, he's just talking about natural body, okay, the physical body. But in verses 3 and 4, we see this term war, okay? We do not war according to the flesh. And then he talks in verse 4 about the weapons of our warfare, right? So the, the thing here is really interesting. The word war, um, <clears throat> one of the primary meanings of it is the warfare of the apostolic mission. They say, what in the world does that mean? Glad you asked. We're going to find out. All right. The war of the apostolic mission. Now, what is the... what? What was the apostolic mission? Okay, am I moving too fast, Gilbert? Am I blurring the camera? Okay, we're good. All right, so um, <clears throat> apostolic mission. When Jesus decides to give a name to his disciples, he doesn't pick a name that the religious community would have understood. He could have called them patriarchs, priests, prophets. Uh, you know, he could have he chosen a name that the religious community would have been able to associate with and say, okay, yeah, that's cool. We can agree with that. He doesn't do that. He chooses this term, apostle. Now, apostles were not a religious term. Apostle, the term apostle was actually, again, a military term. Okay. It was a military term. It was actually first started by the Greeks. Anybody ever heard of a man by the name of Alexander the Great? All right. Okay, Alexander the Great. If you remember, Alexander the Great, um, and I think he was like in his 20s, uh, basically takes over the known world, uh, you know, the inhabited world of his time. And the, and the thing that he had in his mind was that in his mind, in his thinking, the Greek culture was the most amazing, beautiful, superior culture in all the world. Okay? And so um, there was a term, man, I remember this middle school or high school, Hellenization. Hellenization was the term, it was the idea of making all the world look like Greece. And that's what Alexander the Great was all about. So what they would do, Alexander the Great had a two-fold plan, two-fold strategy. The first, the first uh, strategy, obviously, was to have military victory. Okay? All right, it's military victory. So he would go into a region, and, and he would bring his army, and they would conquer that territory with military might, military force. 
But here's the thing. You got to remember, they didn't have cars. They didn't have planes. They didn't have emails. They didn't have, I mean, if you wanted to get a message that there's a revolt, you send a rider on his horse and that could take weeks to get back to the homeland. Hey, we've got a revolt. And then they've got to read it, process it, gather the army, get everybody together. And maybe it's months by the time they get back to wherever they had victory, but now they have a revolt. So Alexander's thinking was this, it's not enough to have military victory. It's not enough to have military might. We also need to have the victory of culture. So they would have military victory and then they would have culture victory. So basically what it was is after the military had their victory, then they would send the second wave. The second wave was led by generals who were called apostles. And their entire mission, their one mission, the one mission of the apostles was to change the culture of this newly conquered territory to match the homeland. Change the culture of this new territory to match the homeland. So the government of Greece, right? Their government philosophies, their government structure, bring that into the new land. Our ideas of education, bring that into the new land. Our language, remember, what makes Jesus and the apostles um, preaching of the gospel so successful was that during that time, because of the Greeks and then followed by the Greeks was the Romans, you had one language. Everybody spoke Greece or Greek, right? Everybody, even um, now, uh, this is, you remember the, um, oh, the Septuagint, which is the Greek interpretation of the Old Testament okay, which was 300 years before Christ, it's actually the oldest translation we have of, of the Old Testament, um, that is what was being used in the synagogues in many cases, okay? They were, everything was one language, all the road systems, all of this was because of the Greeks, then followed by the Romans, they kept the same, the same thing. And so what you have is apostles would take their army, but not to go and fight an enemy, to go and change the culture, change their beliefs, values, government, education, um, their, their arts and entertainment, their, their architecture, um, all everything that Greece stood for and believed, you bring that into the new land that's been conquered. So much to the point that if if the generals or Alexander the Great walked into this territory a thousand miles away from Greece, it looked like Greece, sounded like Greece, smelled like Greece, operated like Greece. Everything in the culture changed to match the homeland. This is the apostolic mission. The war of apostle of the apostles was not a war against a powerful enemy it was the war of culture culture which is your values your mindsets right so so let me say it this way jesus when he names his his disciples apostles he is basically telling them here is your mission. Because they would have known what apostles were. Apostles were the generals of shifting culture. So when he's telling them, you are the generals of changing the culture, that was the warfare. So let me say it this way. <clears throat> Jesus was the first wave of attack. He was the military might that brought us victory over the enemy. 
But the second wave is where you and I come in. We are supposed to be the apostolic company. We are supposed to be the ones who are shifting the culture on earth, the territory that Jesus has conquered, to match the homeland of heaven. The language of heaven, the culture of heaven, the, the values. What does heaven think about government, education, business, all of these things? That is the culture that we now bring into the homeland or into this territory of earth. So, so when he says here, the war that we're battling, we always want to think, man, we got, we're battling some powerful devil. I want to tell you the greatest devil that you'll ever battle is the one between your ears, okay? <laughs> it's the lies. Now, I'm not saying there is no devil. I'm not saying that the devil doesn't have maybe power. But you know that there is a difference between power and authority, okay? The kingdom, so the enemy might have power, but the kingdom has both power and authority. That's a whole nother ball game. Okay, so, so we, have, we have made a, a bigger... Now, remember, here's a prophetic picture in the Old Testament of why they didn't enter in to what God said was already theirs. They looked at the land of inheritance. Israel looks at the land of inheritance, and what they see first are, is a large enemy. I said the enemy is like a, they're giants. They're huge. We're like grasshoppers. So what was the one thing that kept them from actually occupying what God said was already theirs? Big enemy. That was their focus. They were focused on a huge enemy. And God's like, hey, I've already taken care of that. All you got to do is step. Wherever you step, it's victory. Oh, it looks really dangerous over there. But step over there and you'll see it's victory. Because I'm, I'm with you. I've already... And even Caleb says, don't be afraid of those enemies. God has removed their protection. God has removed their authority. They're, they're our bread, guys, right? So, so Jesus is the first wave of attack that has, that has stripped the enemy of, of authority. We are supposed to be the second wave that comes in to bring the culture of the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6.10, right? So the war that he says here, it's interesting to me that when I looked up uh, in the original language, that one of the meanings here was of the apostolic mission. But this war is about culture. It's about thinking. It's about values. It's about mindsets. That's what this was all about here. Okay? So, um, all right, we better get, keep moving here because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay, stay stuck on that for a long time. Um, so... So the, the war, the greatest warfare you'll ever face is not against the enemy. Okay, the greatest warfare you'll ever face are the unrenewed areas of your thinking. The areas of your thinking that have not matched with the homeland, with the kingdom, with what God thinks, with the culture of heaven. Okay, so that is the greatest warfare that you will ever face. All right, now, now he says here in verse 4, for the weapons, that word weapons, actually the very first meaning of it is tools. The tools or the implements of our warfare. Okay, um, they're not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. And I already talked to you about strongholds, talked to you about what all that is. That's what I started off with. Uh, if you just are tuning in, go back and rewatch. Uh, later on, because I go into strongholds pretty, um, pretty extensively earlier in the message. But what I want to see here, <clears throat> where he says, he, he says in verse 4, pulling down strongholds. And then in verse 5, he begins to describe what that is. Verse 5 is actually describing what pulling down strongholds looks like or what it is. So he says there in verse 5, Casting down arguments. Uh, maybe some translations that you have might say imaginations. Right? Okay. I need a bigger board. <laughs> okay. All right. We're in verse 5. 
Um, imaginations or arguments. Now, when you think arguments, don't think, you know, like uh, at home having an argument. That's not what it's talking about there. Um, the Greek word there is logismos. Logismos. Sorry, that's a terrible G. Logismos. Okay. That's a Z. <laughs> All right. Um, now, how many of you, you, you might recognize part of this? Logos, right? Logos, um, which we know is what Jesus is called, the Logos of God. Logos meaning uh, logic. Okay, that's where we actually get the word logic from. So, so logismos, here's the meaning of logismos. It simply is this. It is to, it's a funny word, reckon, okay, to reckon, like, you know, remember those old movies, like, what do you reckon that means, right? Okay, so what do you think that means, okay? Uh, logismos is your reasoning, your logic, your calculations. It is actually a... a it was actually used in, in Greece as a mathematical term, like the calculations, okay? So it's your calculation, your computation, right? Your, your reasoning or your logic. So he says here, casting down or, or pulling down <clears throat> reasoning, logic, okay? And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Oh, so a stronghold in a negative sense is basically my calculations, my reasoning, my logic that I am placing higher than the reasoning of God the calculation of God, the logic of God. Any way that I think, contrary to His way of thinking, that I place above His logismos. I mean, oh, God has a logismos. God has a, reg, uh, a reasoning, a calculation, a logic, a thinking. So whenever I place my thinking above His. So God says this about me, but I say this. That's become a stronghold in a negative sense. I've actually raised up a knowledge that is contrary to His above what He already knows. The, the logic of God or the knowledge of God. So this is where <clears throat> we begin to actually, it's a, it's, a, it's a form of pride if you want to be you know, honest about it, if you want to be real about it, <clears throat> in the sense of, okay, yeah, I know Scripture says that about me. I know God says that about me. But here's the way I feel. How many times do we put our feeling above truth, right? I know God will never leave me or forsake me, right? And that's what God says. That's what Scripture says. But then here's, here comes a day where I just, I feel down. I feel depressed. I feel lonely. I feel God is far away. And I allow my emotions and my thinking to actually have a higher place than what God has said. Scripture, I mentioned this earlier, Scripture says that we are the righteousness of Christ, right? But there's days that I don't feel the, like I'm the righteousness of Christ. I feel totally different. I feel totally unworthy. I feel inadequate. If I allow my feeling to define my thinking, I've basically, here's what I've done. I've made feelings the highest truth to my life. I have made my feelings the greater truth over Scripture, the greater truth over God's thinking, over God's Word. 
about what he says about me? How many times have we ever had, <clears throat> maybe, uh, maybe not just in Scripture, maybe a, maybe a prophetic word where somebody says something? I mean, I, I've given words at times that the person has a difficult time receiving because their feelings are so contrary to that word or their circumstances are so contrary to that word, right? So when Ezekiel is told to prophesy life to bones that are dry, how many of you know that dry bones, that's like, man, you're, you're, you're wanting to prophesy life to me? It's easy for us to get into a place where we're not able to receive the word of the Lord because we, we have found truth in our, in our circumstance or in our condition rather than in what God says. But see, God always wants to speak a higher word because the only way to shift your state or your condition or your circumstance is to hear a word above what you're facing right now. That's why the, the, the prophetic is so powerful. That's why truth is so powerful because it comes to give you a word beyond what you're experiencing right now. And then you have a choice. Believe the word or believe your experience. It's easy for me to put more trust in what I... So, so like one of, the, one of the ways the last several years that God has been um, moving in my life is through that feeler or that discerner, right? Where I just feel something, I discern something. Or what. And so here's the thing. The dangerous thing is to assume that all of my feelings are from God. Because there's times that I might feel something, but it's not what God feels. Maybe I'm feeling what a person feels. Maybe I'm feeling something because of a circumstance that seems overwhelming in my own life. And, and so I allow that overwhelming feeling to make me have a mindset of defeat rather than of hope that God's going to come through. And there's times, man, I, I, I love, um, I think it was Steve Backlund that was talking about this where he said, uh, when God, there's fireworks going off. Sorry, so don't get scared. Uh, we're out, in the, we're kind of out in the county here. So, <clears throat> um, he was talking about how God began to take him through a process of being a student of His own words, right? Being a student of your own words, because your words will reveal your mindset. So, if I'm in a negative situation, my words will reveal most of the time what I'm really believing. Oh, God's, I, there's no way this is going to come. God's not going to be able to come through for me. This is not going to work. God's not in this. Whatever. And so I'm immediately coming to a conclusion because of my mindset about a situation. And so it was really interesting. I love what Steve said uh, in one of his messages. He said, um, let me see if I can get this right. <clears throat> when, he was, when the Lord was teaching him about being a student of his words, uh, he began to tell, talk to Steve about Steve, like Steve would say something negative. And God would say, Steve, would you like me to come into agreement with you on that? <laughs> and Steve was like, no, Lord, I don't. I don't want you to come in. And so his wife began to be <laughs> the voice of Holy Spirit for him in many instances where Wendy, his wife, would say, Steve, do you want me to come into agreement with you on that? And he's like, no, no, I don't. I don't want you to do that. And and what happens is many times we are, we are, the reason why Holy Spirit wants us to be a student of our words is so that we begin to understand where our thinking is, is based in. Okay? And so, so logismos, reckoning, logic, um, reasoning, we elevate those things above the knowledge of God, above what God knows. Okay? So, <clears throat> All right, so uh, hopefully this is making sense so far. Let me, yeah, let me go ahead and, and uh, let's touch on verse 6. Uh, oh, 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 sorry, let me finish verse 5 here, right? Um, and it says here, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Wow. Notice this, it doesn't say to your obedience. <laughs> Bringing every thought captive to your obedience. Mm -mm. Bringing every thought captive to Christ's 
obedience. Oh, why to Christ's obedience? Because his obedience has become your obedience. Think about this. Romans says, by one man's disobedience. Let me ask you, at what point did you become disobedient? At what point did you fall short? Man, when I was 10 years old, I took a hit of that drug. That's when I, no, no. According to scripture, your disobedience is, does, is not rooted in when you disobeyed. Your disobedience is rooted in when Adam disobeyed. It says that when he sinned, we all became sinners. So, we will agree on that. But then he says, but through one man's obedience. Ah, many are made righteous. Oh, so, so we can say, and... and 99.9% of the church will agree that through Adam's sin, you became a sinner. Through Adam's disobedience, you became disobedient. But then when we bring it to, the Christ, to Christ, who is the greater truth, we're like, well, I don't know about that, brother. That sounds a little, uh, kind of a little weird. That now I'm made righteous on Christ's obedience? Yes. How can, you, how can it only be one way? You can't say it's true of the first Adam and not say that it's true of the last. <laughs> that is not true of the last. So, so here what it says here is that we're bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. To his obedience. In other words, his obedience has now become your obedience. What, he, what Jesus has earned through his obedience he has given to you by inheritance. That's Isaiah 61.10. That he has given to you a robe, a garment of salvation, and a robe of righteousness. That your righteousness is not something that you've earned. A right state before God is not something that you have earned. It's something that he earned and gave to you as inheritance. And now I need to bring every thought captive to his obedience that he is now transferred over to me. This is the power of exchange in the Old Testament sacrifice. That when a person brought their, the sacrifice to the altar, they would confess their sin over that sacrifice, and the state of that man was transferred to the, to the offering, and the state of the offering was transferred to the man. And he would walk away from that altar he would walk away from that sacrifice in a different state than the way that he came because of the sacrifice. If the man walked away concluding, I still have that sin, then what he is saying is that the offering didn't work. You have come to the altar of the cross and the Lamb of God you placed every, your state on the Lamb of God and the Lamb of God stretched His hand toward you and put His state of holiness and righteousness and identity upon you so that when you walk away from that sacrifice, you can conclude you have a different state before God. He who knew no sin took it upon Himself to give you His state before the Father. So now I have the righteousness of Christ upon me by simple faith, Romans says. Now I have the same exact relationship with the Father that Jesus had with the Father. I have the access to the heavens that Jesus had to the heavens. Everything the sacrifice had now becomes yours by simple exchange. I need to bring every thought captive to the obedience of the Lamb. I'm unworthy. That's not what the obedience of the Lamb says. I'm disqualified. That's not what the obedience of the Lamb says. I'm, uh, God's far from me. That's not what the sacrifice says. I need to bring every thought captive 
to the obedience of the Lamb of God. The obedience of what Jesus has accomplished. Not my obedience, because that will be up and down, up and down. His obedience, which is always 100% consistent. i got to be honest with you. I've never seen this before. <laughs> this is the first time I've seen this. It's, this is just some revelation flowing right now in verse 6. The obedience of Christ. Taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This changes everything. This changes everything. All right, I'm running out of time. Okay, so, <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm glad we went back to verse 5. We get to take every thought captive to what Jesus accomplished. Amen? Now, verse 6, and being ready to punish all. Now, this sounds really like, what is he talking about here? We're going we're gonna to make this uh, a little more clear, okay? Bring it every being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, I used to think, now I used to teach this like, all right, we're going to punish everybody's sin whenever ours is, whenever we're perfect before God. Now, that's the way it sounds, right? But that is not what he's saying here, okay? So <clears throat> where he says here, uh, being ready to punish. That word punish there, listen to this. You would think this means to, like, beat someone, okay? All right? The word punishment there means to vindicate one's rights. This is the first meaning in the Greek. To vindicate one's right. To do one justice. To protect. To defend. Guys, that chain, that's like, why are we translating this punish when it literally means to vindicate one's right, to do one justice, to protect, to defend? It's actually used in Luke 18, uh, verses 3 and verses 5, verses 3 and 5, when the when the woman is seeking justice, the widow is is seeking justice from the unrighteous judge. And, and he says, man, I better give her justice um, because she's going to weary me. That's the same word. It's not punishment. It's justice. It's protection. It's defending. It is vindicating one's right. Oh, my gosh. I mean, this is insane. Okay? So he says, so we are ready to bring justice, to vindicate, to protect, to defend all, now, disobedience. Now, the word disobedience there means to hear amiss, to hear incorrectly. In other words, it's to hear lies. It's to hear and to receive lies. Okay, <clears throat> Here, let's say it this way, to protect and defend someone, all right, to bring justice in an area where they have heard lies. To bring justice to a person in the area where they have heard lies, where they have been bound to the lies where they have been bound to hearing amiss, to hearing incorrectly. That you and I actually get to bring justice to someone's life who has been bound to lies, who has been bound to, to deception. That you and I get to bring heaven's justice to protect them and to defend them from the lies that they've heard. And then it says, when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, this is crazy. That word obedience there is the, is the same root word as disobedience mentioned a minute ago or earlier. That word obedience there is the hearing of revelation. In fact, the literal meaning there is to hear the door 
open. To hear the door and open. Those are the primary meanings of this word obedience. To hear the door. What door? The door of revelation. The door of truth. Right? To hear revelation. So here's what it's telling us. When you're hearing correctly, when you're concluding correctly, when you have come to the, from a stronghold of lies to a stronghold of truth, then you are ready to go and defend and go and, and bring justice to those who have been listening to lies, hearing lies all their life. My goodness. I mean, it changes everything. Changes everything. So, oh, man. Now, this has been fun tonight. <laughs> we're, we're already at an hour now. And uh, it, it's, been, it's been so fun um, to protect and defend or to protect, defend, and bring someone justice in an area where they heard lies because you are hearing correctly. Thank you, Lord, for that. <clears throat> Here's what I want to I leave you with. Um, Holy Spirit is in the business of shifting beliefs, shifting mindsets, right? He is the spirit of truth. Why is he the spirit of truth? Because he is the solution to the lies. <laughs> he, he, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? And the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the one who is, the, the spirit who is one with Jesus and with the Father, the, the triune Godhead, is truth. And Holy Spirit is operating in the earth today to bring us to the logismos of God. To bring us to the thinking, or to the thinking, to the thinking, to the reckoning, to the imagination, to the, to the belief system of God. And what you're going to see is you're going to see more, you're going to see a shift of trying from, from, primarily focusing on tearing down strongholds to primarily focusing on building up the stronghold of God. Because you can tear down strongholds, but if you don't build something in its place, the lies at some point will come back. So, so we, in the church world, we have focused on tearing down strongholds, but in the kingdom mindset, the focus is on building up more than it is on tearing down. Because, now I'm not saying there is no tearing down. Yes, we dismantle lies, but it's by presenting truth. Okay? So when you present truth, it begins to dismantle and replace. And this is where you're going to see believers walk in true freedom, true deliverance that remains. All right? And you're going to see this shifting uh, what, you what you call spiritual warfare, what you call tearing down strongholds, what you call deliverance. There is a kingdom model of what that looks like that's being restored to the body of Christ. And, uh, and I want to encourage you, as the Holy Spirit begins to make you a student of your words, let Him become the Spirit of truth that dismantles and replaces the strongholds of lies with the stronghold of truth. Amen? Because that's kingdom right there. That's the way the kingdom works. And so... So let me just pray for you. Um, man, I had fun tonight. I had a great time. <laughs> uh, this has been uh, so wonderful to just share with you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for truth. We thank you for what Jesus has accomplished. Oh, Lord, I, just, I thank you that right now you are healing hearts. You're healing um, the soul. You're healing the emotions. You're healing even thought processes. Lord, you're healing our, our mindsets. Where there were lies, you're replacing it with truth. Where there was deception, you're replacing it with what you know to be true. And so, Lord, right now, I just thank you for Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth. And I thank you that you are going to continue to, to bring in the strongholds of God into our life. And Lord, I just pray for your people right now that there would be an awakening of what you think about them, what you say about them, of what Scripture declares 
that we are in you. I thank you for the exchange that's taken place between us and the Lamb of God, between us and the obedience of Christ. And so, Lord, right now, any thought process that we have, that we have lifted up above what you know to be true, what we have lifted up above what you say, Lord, we, we submit those areas to you. We submit every way of thinking unto you. Lord, and whatever doesn't line up with what you believe, you have our permission to dismantle it and replace it. We say, Lord, dismantle and replace any way of thinking that doesn't align with yours. And we invite your thinking. We invite your logismos, your reasoning, your logic to consume us, contradict all of our contradictions of what you have said. Contradict all of our contradictions of what you have believed about us. And I pray that we begin to think about ourselves the way you do, that we think about you the way you think about yourself, and that we would see from your perspective. Right now, I speak life to the dry bones. Right now, I speak wholeness to those that are broken. Wherever a lie has been, uh, has been ruling in your life, making you feel inadequate, making you feel um, depressed, making you feel like you're distant from God and, and God is, is against you. We, we bring the justice of heaven into your life for every area where you've been believing a lie. And we say, Lord, that truth will come in and set us free. That truth will make us free. And so we thank you, Lord, for that. Father, I thank you for what you're doing right now. I, I, I just, I'm so grateful, Lord, for Holy Spirit shifting our beliefs, shifting our mindsets. So, Father, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Appreciate you guys for, for watching tonight, for watching online. Appreciate those that are here tonight. Uh, if you'd like to give online, you can give at uh, Many Waters Global. It's manywatersglobal.org, manywatersglobal.org. You can give online uh, if you'd like to do that. We, uh, like I said, we've got our conference coming up in Tucson, Arizona, and then that's uh, January 14th and 15th. Then the last weekend, uh, 28, 29, 30 of January, we'll be here at Church of Acts. We'll be doing a gospel of the kingdom. What is the, the gospel of the kingdom? Um, the, you know, we're, it's, that's changing everything, right? <clears throat> we, have, we have preached a different gospel than Jesus. <laughs> and we're coming back to the gospel of Jesus. And what does that look like? What does that sound like? And then um, last weekend of February, we'll have my friend Jake Bullard. We'll be doing a whole weekend on dreams, uh, dream interpretation. Even uh, He's got an amazing thing on redeeming nightmares. And so we'll talk about that. Um, but we're so honored uh, to have you join us tonight. We bless you and uh, just declare the Holy Spirit will continue to just surge in your heart and in your mindset. And you'll begin to think the way God thinks, believe the way God believes, and that the culture of the homeland will find its place in you and you will bring that culture everywhere you go. We love you. We bless you. We'll see you later. Amen.